All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Christina Burton. I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions Operations at Penn Engineering. And we are hosting this event in particular because of our partnership with the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. So we welcome all students who learned about this opportunity through that fund. And we also welcome those who joined us based on some postings you might've seen from our social media or emails that were distributed. So I am very thrilled to have this opportunity to talk with you about two of our departments at Penn Engineering. Uh, that's computer and information science, as well as electrical and systems engineer. You're going to hear directly from the graduate chairs in that department about the graduate program offerings they have. And you'll also hear from some students who will answer questions about why they decided to attend Penn and how their time is going, especially now that we're all working remotely. So um, thank you for being with us. And as I said, uh, here's the agenda for today. I will provide a brief overview um, so I, you guys can be up to date on the University of Penn as well as Penn Engineering and some things we have to offer. Um, and then it'll be followed by um, Dr. Mayor Nayak, who is gonna speak with you about computer and information science. And then Dr. Victor Preciado, who will speak about electrical and systems engineering. But before we get onto our agenda, I'd like to introduce you to our Associate Dean of Graduate Programs, Dr. Boon Thao Lu, who will give you a, a welcome before we get started. Thank you, Christina. Thank you to everyone who is here today. Uh, I'm Boon Thao Lu. I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs and also faculty in Computer Science Department. Uh, we This is a a fairly intimate audience, so feel free to ask any questions along the way. Uh, we would hope to see you apply to Penn at uh, some point in future, and uh, hope you have a great session. And uh, with that, I will hand it back to Christina uh, and uh, uh, let the uh, graduate chairs uh, tell you all about the exciting things that's happening in the computer and information science and electrical and systems engineering departments. Thank you, Dr. Liu. And just as a reminder, because we are an intimate, uh, intimate community right now, we do welcome you, as Dr. Liu said, to utilize the chat feature if you have any questions or if you are confident enough, you can unmute yourself. We also encourage you to show your video if you're in a, uh, have the ability to do so, so that we can all be looking at each other and get to know each other a little bit more. Finally, I'd like to let you know that this session will be recorded because I know a few people were not able to be in attendance today. So this will be recorded and the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel at Penn Engineering Graduate Admissions. So without further ado, I'd like to give you just a brief overview of the University of Pennsylvania. We are the first university in the nation and we're really proud of that. We're also the first Ivy League. So pictured here, you see um, some of our beautiful architecture. We're located in West Philadelphia, right in the middle of West Philly. We're very close, about a 10 minute drive from Center City, Philadelphia. So it gives you access to all the city of Philadelphia has to offer. And we have a lot to offer in the city because we are the sixth largest city in the nation. So Philly is home to a lot of arts. Um, we have a large art community and so it's just, endless opportunity for entertainment and for engagement. So pictured here is um, our quad, our Pearlman quad, as well as Houston Hall. Now, Houston Hall is actually the first, the nation's first college student union. So again, there are a lot of firsts at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we're proud of our history and we're proud of our resources and what we're able to offer to students. Here is a picture of, um, this is a locust walk. And so this is basically the major vein of our campus. So even though we have over 24,000 students and we have 12 different schools at the University of Pennsylvania, this major vein of Locust Walk basically goes through the entire campus. So it allows you to connect with the medical school, the dental school, school of engineering, the art school, the business school. So it, it gives you an intimate feel of being on a college campus, even though just one block away is a major street of West Philadelphia, which is Walnut Street. So what I like about Penn is that we have all the resources of a very large institution, but you can build community that matters to you. All right, and so let's just talk about specifically Penn Engineering by the numbers. So as I mentioned, there are 12 schools in total with the University of Penn. Penn Engineering is one of them. We were established in 1714 by Benjamin Franklin, the nation's first engineer. And so we have six 
15 different master's programs offerings and six PhD program offerings. We have about 13 research centers and institutions that are um, primarily engineering based. We have over 150 faculty and over 2000 full-time graduate students. And as you see, the large number at the bottom is our research expenditure expenditure, which means we are able to afford students the opportunity to pursue research that matters to them. Uh, here's a listing of our different master's programs. As I mentioned, we have 16. One of those 16 is an online master's program, the first among all the Ivy Leagues. It is the Computer and Information Technology Online Master's Program. And we will be expanding our online master's programs in the near future. So we look forward to introducing those to you as well. And so you'll see here that there are a couple of programs that fall with under computer and information science. And Dr. Nyack will review some of those offerings, but I just wanted to point out some of those programs here, which are computer graphics and game technology, computer and information sciences has a master's and a doctoral offering, computer and information technology, as well as data science. So you'll hear a little bit more about that shortly. And then, as I mentioned, we have six different doctoral programs, beginning with bioengineering, computer and information science, chemical and biomolecular engineering, electrical and systems engineering, material science, and mechanical engineering and applied mechanics. Uh, so unfortunately, if you're interested in our doctoral program, all of the applications for our doctoral programs close December 15th each year. So you missed a deadline if you weren't able to make it this year, but we look forward to accepting applications from you, hopefully in the near future. And I will go over the application deadlines for our master's program shortly. But I just wanted to give you a glimpse since you can't be on campus with us. We, we wish that we could invite you on campus at this time, but for everyone's safety, we're doing this virtually. And I just wanted to show you, um, give you a glimpse of what the Penn Engineering campus looks like. So you're seeing pictures here of sort of the headquarters of Penn in engineering, which is a huge complex that consists of four different buildings. You have the Moore building, um, you have Levine, you also have, um, sorry, I keep forgetting the names, Levine, the town building, and Skirkanich. So those four buildings make up this huge complex that you're seeing here. And within that complex is a couple of things. So we have several different classrooms. We have laboratories that students do work out of and with faculty. We also have the graduate admissions office where I'm located in the town building. And also the first um, modern computer is actually located in here as well, ENIAC. And then he pictured here, this is not a part of the Penn Engineering campus, but this is one of the laboratories that our engineering students use. This is the Singh Center for Nanotechnology that's located almost directly across the street from the engineering complex. And so within this center, we have students doing research as well as faculty. Um, and we also have students from local universities that come here to do research in nan nanofabrication. There are six different areas of research that are conducted out of here in their nanophotonics, mechanics, microfluidics, nanomaterials, biological applications, and microsystems. And you might hear from a lot of some of our um, electrical and system engineering students do research out of here. So you might hear about that when Dr. Preciado speaks. Here's another one of our research centers. Um, one of uh, the newest research centers for Penn Engineering. This is Pennovation Center. And so this is located um, just off campus. So it's not uh, very close to um, the complex that I just showed you, which is the headquarters for Penn Engineering, but it's about a mile away and it's located right along the Schuylkill River, River in Philadelphia. And so this center has two floors of co-working space. So of course, students um, are utilize the space as well as faculty, but then there are also some um, local entrepreneurs from the area who may use the space to do work. So it's a very collaborative um, place. We have wet and dry labs available um, with different machines. And on a third floor, it's occupied by the Penn Engineering Research and Collaboration Hub, uh, which integrates computer science, electrical and mechanical and systems engineering. So this again is another center that a lot of our computer and information science and or electrical and systems engineering PhD students utilize. So I mentioned before, I wanted to talk about the deadlines before we get into the really cool stuff from faculty and students. So if you are interested in applying to one of our master's program, uh, we do have an upcoming deadline of February 1st. So I've listed out all the um, master's deadlines that have a February 1st um, deadline. 
I'm sorry, master's programs that have a February 1st deadline. And then there are a few that have a March 15th deadline. Um, and their deadline is a little bit later because they actually have an early decision deadline, which has passed. It was November 15th. So if you're interested in applying, please take note of these deadlines. And now I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Mayor Nayak, who's going to speak with you about computer and information science. Thank you, Christina. Uh, and hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's uh, uh, my pleasure to uh, be here for the first time uh, to uh, talk at this uh, event. Uh, even though it's virtual, I hope you find it uh, very informative. And uh, we have uh, several of our uh, students here also uh, to answer questions uh, in a panel uh, after uh, myself and Victor are done. Okay. Christina, would you like to continue using the slides that you sent me or do you want me to project? Oh, sure. Yeah, let me just pull them up for you. Give me one second, I'm sorry. No, no worries. Um, it's just three slides that I need. Um, okay. Um, so I have them open now. Okay, let me just go to share screen. All right, just Thank let me you. know when I can speed through. Thank you, yes, uh, please go to the next one. Yes, so um, the computer science uh, department, um, uh, I believe Christina already mentioned uh, is, um, uh, it, it is, it goes pretty far back. Um, and uh, we have a long history uh, in uh, computing. So for example, we uh, awarded the first and the second PhD uh, ever in computer science. And uh, the, the, the first uh, modern computer that you call the ENIAC uh, was uh, uh, built at uh, Penn. Uh, in fact, this happens to be a, a particularly um, auspicious year because uh, it, it will be the 75th anniversary of the ENIAC. So I encourage you to um, go to eniacday.org. So it's one word, eniacday.org uh, to learn more about uh, this event, uh, which will be held on February 15th uh, of this year. Um, um, what do we do in our uh, department? Um, well, we um, are uh, pretty broad uh, and deep. So we cover, uh, uh, all areas uh, of computer science uh, from theory and algorithms uh, to uh, programming languages, operating systems, to machine learning, um, natural language processing, robotics, um, and even uh, more uh, uh, niche uh, fields, for example, uh, real time and cyber physical systems um, and, and many others. Um, the way I like to think about uh, the themes in our department are uh, the following three. Um, so the first is uh, what we call um, intelligent systems um, um, and, uh, and data science, where uh, the goal is to take uh, all the raw data uh, in the world um, and analyze it um, to make informed decisions um, um, and take intelligent actions. Um, and in this theme, uh, we see all uh, the specializations of computer science uh, at play. So you see uh, theory and algorithms for efficiently uh, um, analyzing this data. You see uh, work in distributed systems for um, scaling uh, these uh, uh, algorithms. Um, you see uh, machine learning and AI um, and natural language processing um, in order to make um, these intelligent decisions and so on. Uh, the second of the three themes uh, is um, uh, reliable, secure, and trustworthy systems and services. Um, so uh, in particular, if you uh, see where um, computing is headed, it is increasingly in the cloud. Um, and many of you might have seen or heard uh, in the news about uh, very high profile uh, cybersecurity uh, attacks uh, or 
services going down at critical times. We just had one with, I believe, Google and Gmail a few uh, weeks ago that many of you might have noticed. We had Slack go down uh, that almost all of us use uh, a few days ago. So uh, those are the kinds of uh, uh, problems that uh, we study in this theme. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, um, uh, they can bring uh, the world to a standstill. Um, uh, it just shows you how much we rely, we have come to rely on them. Um, again, this spans all areas of computer science. Um, and finally, the third theme um, is um, um, computing is uh, happening uh, in the context of society today. Uh, and, uh, and so there are a lot of issues that uh, need uh, more uh, attention and research. Uh, for example, can we design algorithms that are fair and uh, ethical? Um, we see increasingly decisions being made uh, by uh, machines rather than humans. Um, what guarantees can we provide uh, when these machines make these decisions? How does uh, uh, computer science uh, uh, interact with um, other aspects uh, of knowledge such as law, uh, medicine, business, and so on? So we actually have uh, a fair amount of research going on even in uh, this uh, theme. Um, um, so I hope I give, gave you some sense uh, without uh, any slides about these, uh, uh, about the, this, the, the, the breadth and depth of the kind of research that is going on uh, in our department, okay? So we have uh, 37 uh, standing faculty members uh, and many more uh, who, are, uh, who have secondary appointments in our department. Um, I like to think of our department as being in uh, the Goldilocks zone. It's neither too small nor too large. So if you have a very small department, then you're left uh, uh, wanting uh, to learn certain things that we are not, we don't have the expertise in. So we are certainly not uh, a small department in that sense. At the same time, we don't want to be a sprawling department where uh, silos start being established. And so it's very hard for you to uh, work uh, across uh, areas and, co and collaborate. In fact, I personally believe uh, many of the next big advances in our field will happen uh, at the boundary or at the uh, intersection of uh, different areas, not just within computer science, but also between computer science and other departments in engineering and even uh, other parts of our uh, vibrant university that Christina just gave a wonderful overview of, um, so including medicine, uh, business, um, the natural sciences, uh, arts, and so on, okay? Um, we have um, six master's programs and a PhD uh, program that I'll talk about uh, shortly. Um, we also have centers, uh, some of which are listed here and others are uh, continue to uh, incubate. Um, and these centers bring together uh, uh, researchers and academics uh, from again, different parts of the university um, in order to uh, uh, pool together uh, to solve some grand challenges. For example, the Warren Center is uh, studying um, um, uh, problems at the intersection of computer science and, um, and economics and networks um, and data sciences. We have uh, the famed GRASP lab, uh, which uh, is pushing the frontiers of uh, robotics. Uh, we have the PRECISE Center, uh, which is doing a lot of exciting research uh, in cyber physical systems, especially as it relates to uh, uh, medical systems um, and medicine in general. And finally, we have um, uh, the Primal Center, uh, which is uh, studying uh, problems in uh, uh, the field of machine learning, um, which is becoming increasingly uh, a big deal uh, in all parts of uh, society. So here are the uh, six master's programs and the PhD program that I uh, uh, promised to talk about. Uh, I'll begin with our flagship program, which is uh, the second one here uh, called Computer and Information Sciences. Um, 
Um, so this master's program is for you if you have uh, an undergraduate degree in computer science. So it presumes that you have already gained uh, a, a strong foundation uh, in computer science in, in your bachelor's. And then this is for you to continue along that path um, and, um, and take more advanced uh, courses, possibly do research. Um, um, and um, um, so, so this is uh, what this program is about. It presumes a bachelor's in computer science. On the other hand, if you don't have a bachelor's degree in computer science, then we have a unique program called uh, the Computer and Information Technology Program, uh, or the CIT program for short. And we recently, just a year ago, launched its online version as well. Uh, if uh, and this is for students who cannot uh, move to our campus in Philadelphia. Um, both versions of this program are equally rigorous and thriving. Um, um, and identical in all uh, respects, um, except for one being uh, uh, on campus and the other being virtual. Um, and these programs assume that you have little to no uh, experience in computer science. Um, and, and so we have these very different pathways uh, that together are very inclusive. If you missed a shot at uh, studying computer science in your bachelor's, you still have the opportunity to be a part of um, all the excitement uh, that is uh, happening right now in computer science. Okay. The third program that I'd like to talk about um, is uh, data science. Again, uh, this was a program that uh, didn't exist five years ago uh, with the uh, amount of data that is being generated right now and the power that it has uh, to help us make informed decisions. We have launched um, a master's degree uh, for those of you who might be interested in studying how to use this data uh, in order to solve uh, uh, problems um, that you are interested in. Related to it is scientific computing. So if you'd like to use data to uh, solve uh, problems in the physical sciences and the engineering, then scientific computing is uh, something you'd want to look at. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to use the data for uh, fields other than the physical sciences, uh, so for example, in medicine, in bioinformatics, uh, in business, economics, and many other fields, then data science is uh, uh, the program uh, that you would be more interested in. And lastly, we have uh, two more uh, master's programs, the, the computer graphics program, which is uh, for those of you who might be interested in um, so interactive media and all the advances that are happening right now uh, in, uh, uh, for example, game technology. And lastly, the robotics program. Again, um, it is a program that has been uh, uh, driven by all of the advances you are seeing in uh, robotics. Okay, so these are the six master's programs. I'd like to pause to see a question here. Great, does the data science program require any background in computer science? So it's a great question. Um, I can't recall this off the top of my head. Um, um, I will have Christina get back uh, to you. Uh, Christina, do you happen to know anything about this? No, but I can get that information as you continue the presentation. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Uh, my guess is that it would require uh, um, uh, sort of mo little to moderate background. That's just my guess from the courses that I'm seeing uh, in this degree program. So we do have some core courses where uh, you are, um, are taught sort of the basics of computer science uh, that are needed for data science, okay? Um, certainly on our campus set pen we allow um, many of our non computer science majors to uh, take courses in uh, this uh, program and so that is where i'm guessing that we wouldn't need um, uh, uh, too much of a background in computer science 
And lastly, the program that I'm mainly in charge of is the doctoral program. Uh, as Christina mentioned, the deadline for this just passed, uh, December 15th. Uh, but you can uh, start preparing for uh, the next year's deadline uh, if you are interested. Uh, we have a very vibrant uh, PhD uh, program um, and, and it is centered around our PhD students uh, in helping them uh, realize their full potential and go on to become leaders in computer science, whether in academia, uh, doing research and teaching, or in industry at research labs, uh, at companies such as Google, Facebook, Apple, Intel, and many other companies, uh, big and small. Um, uh, or for example, uh, becoming entrepreneurs, uh, doing their own uh, startups. Um, so there are many different uh, pathways that I'll talk about uh, shortly as well. Okay. The PhD program typically lasts um, uh, five years. Um, I should say the master's programs can be completed in one and a half to two years. Uh, the PhD program averages around five years, but by no means is a fixed length uh, program. It depends on how you're progressing uh, through it. Um, so after graduation, as I mentioned, um, there are many different uh, pathways and you can see our alumni in uh, all of these uh, different uh, uh, endeavors. Um, uh, you can continue doing uh, research and advanced development uh, in a tech company. Uh, you could become a data scientist or an engineer in one of various sectors, uh, such as tech, uh, finance, pharma, medicine. Um, in fact, uh, increasingly all of these uh, sectors have uh, uh, a, a big component of tech, uh, which makes it a very exciting, a very exciting time to be um, in this field at right now. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the last one uh, uh, pursuing academic research and teaching is if you are in our doctoral uh, program uh, primarily. Okay, so, and at the bottom here are some links where you can learn a lot more about us. Um, uh, and please feel free to uh, email me uh, if you have any further questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nayak. And so now we'll move on to learn about the Electrical and Systems Engineering Department from Dr. Victor Preciado. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. So uh, I'm assuming you can hear me and you can see me. Good, all right, so, yes. so let me share my screen with you. Okay. There we are. Okay. So, uh, as Christina said, my name is uh, Victor Preciado. I'm a graduate chair and associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering. So, uh, my background is on network science, data science, and that's uh, the main topic of my research. In particular, I'm interested in the intersections of dynamics, data, and control, and uh, as you can, I mean, if you're curious, you can get in my website and, and read more about uh, what I do. But one of the things that we've been working lately is in the control of the COVID epidemics, essentially using engineering tools to model the dynamics of COVID and using also optimization tools to find the optimal allocation to contain the spread of the disease. And uh, yeah, so this is just a quick snapshot of, of what I do and, and my background. So let me go straight to uh, tell you a little bit more about the Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering. So uh, from Christina, you already heard all the departments in the School of, of Engineering and Applied Science here at Penn. We are obviously one of them. So let me tell you about the internal structure of our department. So essentially, we have uh, three different areas of three different uh, pillars. Essentially, we have a group of faculty who is uh, working on nano devices and nano systems. So topics of research that you can find in this particular area are nano electronics, nano photonics, quantum devices, integrated system, devices and systems, and nanoscale, NANS, NANS power electronics. The second area of research is uh, circuits and computer engineering. So 
research topics in that particular area are computer engineering, digital circuits, analog, radio frequency, millimeter wave, and metric circuit design, Internet of Things, embedded and cyber physical systems. And then our largest area is information and decision systems. And the topics that we cover are control optimization robotics, data science, network science, communications, information theory, signal processing, markets, and social systems. So that last area is uh, where I'm uh, personally included. And roughly, the information and decision system is roughly half. Uh, half of our faculty and, and students, and then circuits and nano devices are the other half. Nano devices is roughly 30%, both in number of faculty and students, and circuits and computer engineers are roughly the same. So uh, these are some pictorial representations of, again, the same research areas that I mentioned before. And essentially, as, as you can uh, read on the top, the objective of ESC is to connect the physical with the information world. So here we can have, uh, you know, again, a pictorial representation of what the nano devices and nano systems data is about. Okay, so we have, I will mention later on, uh, our own fabrication facilities in the same center. We also have the circuits and computer engineering. So this is more at the meso scale, if you want to. This is at the nano scale, and this is more micro. Scale, right? So, uh, if you have analog mix, uh, mixing in the circuits, computer architecture, and cyber physical systems, and again, information and decision systems, which is control and robotics, network science, and so Okay, so let me talk. Uh, let me talk to you about our research centers and institutes. So, these are some of the research centers and institutes associated with one of the three areas. So, we have. For nanotechnology, we have the SYNC Center for Nanotechnology. So the pretty picture in the first slide. So this is the look, a very artistic look of the, the SYNC Center for Nanotechnology. So architecturally, it's a very appealing and, and packed with, the, with the essentially brain and machine power. We also have the lab for, uh, for research on the structure of matter, which is adjacent to the the same center. I also have the Nano Bio Interface Center and Time Energy. So something that I have to say here is that uh, throughout the topics um, that you're going to see, something that I would like to remark is uh, the focus of uh, Penn ESC and I would think I mean, uh, general of Penn Engineering in, in problems of importance, societal impact. Right? So essentially, you're going to see lots of applications in the bio side. So you will see, for example, in the nano uh, in the nanotechnology uh, area, there are plenty of research trying to use uh, nanotechnology and nano robotics in biological applications. In fact, there is I invite you to check out in YouTube the videos by Mark Niskin, and essentially you will see Mark is essentially building these uh, nano robots that you can put in a syringe and insert in your blood. These are not going in the COVID uh, vaccine, so don't, don't be worried about not microchipping anybody. Okay, so but it's, it's something good to see. So in the information technology area, we have uh, the Grass Robotic Lab, which is shared also with mechanical computer and computer information systems. We have the Institute for Research in Cognitive Sciences, which is also shared with bioengineering. We have the Precise Lab Center for Embedded uh, Software also shared with other departments, Center for Human Modeling and Simulations, and the Warren Center for Networks and Data Science. So that's what personally um, um, I did, right? So, uh, so this is part of the, uh, essentially a research center that focuses on, on analyzing large scale networks and data science problems. We also have uh, some biotechnology centers. Essentially we have, or we are part of the Penn Center for Bioinformatics, the Penn Genome Frontiers Institute, the Institute for Medicine and Engineering, and the Penn Center for Molecular uh, Discovery. Right. So uh, let me mention or show you some pictures of the nano facilities. So as I mentioned before, this is the, uh, the SYNC Center for Nanotechnology. This is essentially uh, Raj 
uh, Raj Singh, so who was uh, one of the main and the persons of uh, of this uh, of this particular center, with uh, essentially our, our team and some of the directors of the We also have in uh, some of the facilities for the circuits and computer engineering area. So you have here. Uh, the second floor of the moon building, three sides and moon building, and here in the center you have the, the building where the ENIAC, so this was mentioned before, where the ENIAC was uh, built and where uh, John Norman and many scientists were working to build the first uh, electronic uh, computer. And uh, in the information and decision system facilities, again, we have a range of facilities. Uh, we have a space at uh, the Grassa Church. This is a new facilities, uh, mainly focusing on robotics, which have the grass lab. So also for robotics, we have the Warren Center for Networks and Data Science, which is in Warren Street. I don't know if you know here, but uh, that's the address. And also Divine Hall, which is shared with the uh, uh, computer systems and the information systems. Um, so let me mention some of the faculty. Okay, so I'm going to start with the primary faculty in uh, either tenure or in tenure track. So I'm not gonna read the name. So this is the list of some of our faculty. So we have people working in the nanospace, in the IDS space, and, uh, and feel free to essentially uh, go through the ESC website, check them out, and if you find a good match, uh, you know that you should prepare your application for for uh, next winter. Okay, so I uh, make sure that you do your homework and essentially uh, learn a little bit about the professors that you can really be interested to work with. So again, I invite you to check out our, our website and read more about our our uh, faculty. So these are some, some more people. So this is me here. This is uh, George Papas, which is our graduate chair, and, uh, and and many others very world renowned faculty. Uh, we also have a secondary faculty. I believe this list may be uh, out of date, but uh, as it was in the case of uh, computer information systems, uh, we are always actively trying to build bridges with other departments and trying to find the synergies, positive synergies to uh, to help us uh, advance our agenda. So since you have uh, Boom, who I believe it's uh, somewhere online from CIS, uh, Danny Bassett, DJ Kumar, and there are more people, I believe, that are not. So again, the list of connections is pretty broad. It's, uh, uh, it's not only in the School of uh, Engineering, but also we have connections with the uh, world. OK, so this is uh, bragging time. So uh, this is some of the, I believe, also this is out of date. But uh, this is uh, roughly a good approximation of uh, some of the awards uh, by our faculty. So we have two members in the National Academy of Engineering and four ESC faculty nominated for the National Academy of Engineering, two members of the National Academy of Inventors. We have many IEEE Technical Things Awards. So this is something I would like to remark, which is uh, we systematically year by year are, uh, are able to uh, essentially you know, support our students to uh, win the paper awards at the top conferences in much of the field that we're in. And that's something that uh, I would say we are kind of an outlier in this, in this direction. So, so again, we, we have many technical field awards in high technology and, and other uh, associations for quantum systems, photonics, electromagnetics, robotics, and so on. Uh, also, all our hires over the last 15 years have. Uh, Essentially, been awarded the NSF Career Award, which is one of the most prestigious uh, awards uh, given to the NSF for early career faculty. And three of those won the Presidential uh, Career Award. Case. And most school professors are fellows of some society, so this is a prestigious uh, distinction. And uh, currently, we are nominating many young school professors. And also, we have an ESC Awards Committee, in which, as I mentioned before, we strategize about how to uh, promote our students to win these awards and strategize about uh, you know the topics and, the, and how to situate ourselves in a, in a good strategic, strategic positions to promote our, our 
our work, including your work today. So as I mentioned before, uh, one of the, I would say, uh, relevant features of, of Penn ESE, and I, I would be able to say the same for pretty much uh, all the departments in the School of Open Engineering is that our research, we try to focus on societal impact. And if you go to the website uh, for our faculty and, and start exploring the topics that we are working on, all those topics are clearly relevant in, in, our, uh, in our current uh, world. So we're working on topics like uh, transportation, autonomy, like autonomy, like uh, Driving cars, industrial control, other systems. So these are some of the uh, concrete topics that we consider of societal impact that we uh, strategically try to follow, both uh, intellectually and also looking for resources in this area. So here we have health, and this is a natural and kind of obvious choice given the relevance of uh, the medical school and the strength of the bioengineering. Department, so we try to help them with all the signal processing and the devices part of health problems and uh, transportation. So again, we're we're trying to uh, you know, uh, be strategic about the future of autonomous uh, driving cars, the energy, uh, communication, security. So this is just a glimpse of some of the uh, relevant topics that uh, are of importance societally. Also. As I mentioned at the beginning, I would include here uh, control of uh, pandemics, right? So this may sound like a weird topic for an engineer, but if you read the, the papers that we're writing in the engineering community, and this is becoming a very popular topic in engineering, you would see why engineers have something to say when it comes to modeling and control of, of pandemics, right? So in the medical side, they would be able to tell you a lot about the microbiology and the, you know, all the details are the micro scale that when you put uh, these vaccines in the population and you try to implement social distancing measures, these things have a cost and these things have an impact, a global impact in the dynamics of some uh, partially observable variables. And this is the kind of things that we engineers in the information and decision systems, this is the kind of problem that we like and, and have the tools to address. So uh, yeah, so we have uh, also an emphasis on the Internet of Things. So this is a massive, uh, massive space that also shared with other departments and data science. Again, this is a topic that many other departments, uh, mainly CIS, is 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 pursuing, uh, and we're trying to also uh, be part of, of this uh, of this wave. Uh, and this is some exciting research projects. So these are essentially a, a selection of a very large multi-million dollar projects that uh, Penn has been able to land in order to support the research in the societal, uh, societal important problems that I mentioned before. So some are related to transportation, uh, robotics, uh, energy. So essentially, we will see an alignment between those projects and the main topics that we're trying to discuss. All right, so this is another slide to drag about uh, how well we're able to um, essentially uh, place our students. So essentially our students, we are systematically able to place them in top US institutions if you decide to go to academia as well as industry. So you have University of Washington, Illinois, Arizona, Columbia, Columbia, uh, UCLA, Delaware, Duke, Michigan. Um, okay, so I have one student that just got a position at John Hopkins, so I should talk about myself and put that in here. So, so yeah, we're, we're, we're able to systematically place our students in top American institutions as well as foreign institutions. Again, this is uh, just a glimpse. So we have uh, alumni at Kyoto. Another one of my students is now in Osaka. So we have a Waterloo, Dell, Polytechnic, uh, Montreal, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and so on and so forth. So uh, IIS. So, um, so this is in the academic side. We also have very good placement in terms of industry. So you can see here the, essentially the biggest companies out there. So we have Microsoft, Tesla, Facebook, Toyota, Google, Qualcomm, and everything. 
that lock in margin. So this is essentially uh, a list of a selection of some of the companies that uh, we are able to place our students and actually my most recent uh, graduate ended up service and scientists in Facebook. Yeah, so this is, is real. I'm not trying to sell this to you. It's actually very common that we're getting some students in this amazing company. And I believe that's, uh, yeah, so that's all I have. So uh, I don't know if this is now the time to answer questions or the, uh, it's uh, essentially, yeah. So Christina, should I answer questions now or how, how, how do we do it? Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Preciado. So if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask, um, or you can utilize the chat feature. So um, Dr. Preciado and Dr. Nyack, are you able to stay on for a few minutes in case people have questions? Sure. Okay, all right, great. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna move us forward um, with our student panel. So I know we have stu several students on, uh, current graduate students at Penn Engineering, and we thank you for being here. So I'd like you all to just um, one at a time, unmute yourself um, and just tell us a little bit about who you are. And particularly, I do have um, you know some questions for you. So I'd like for you to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, tell us your current learning location and what degree you are pursuing. So um, I'll just go by whose names I see up here first to give us a little bit of order. So Sonia, could you unmute yourself and introduce? Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Cool. So my name is Sonia Roberts. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I am currently in Philadelphia, but not working on campus. I took my robot home, so I have a little home lab set up. Was there anything else that I was supposed to say? Uh, great, did you say the degree you're pursuing? Ah, PhD in electrical and systems engineering. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, next we have Alyssa Huang. Hi everyone, um, I'm Alyssa. I am from New Jersey, which is where I currently am at right now. I am a first year PhD student in the CIS department. So if you have questions about what it's like to start your first year completely remote, definitely let me know. Thanks Alyssa, and then Vasant. Hi, everybody. Um, hope you can hear me all right. I'm Vasant. I am a fourth year, um, well, time flies, in the electrical engineering department uh, doing my PhD degree. Uh, originally, I'm from the suburbs of LA, um, and I focus on like circuits and biomedical devices. Um, I forget if there's anything else to be said, but oh, I'm currently in Philadelphia and I'm coming into the lab. So, um, uh, you know, so I'm here, but things are all right. Thank you, Vasan and Zachary. Hey, uh, I'm Zach. I'm a fifth year PhD student in the CIS department. I'm originally from uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And as of today, I'm currently on month number 10 of working from home. I'm in my apartment in Philadelphia. All right, great. Um, I'm sorry if I know I missed someone. Perpetua, would you unmute yourself? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Perpetual. I'm a second year student in the on-campus MCIT program. Um, I'm from Delaware, and that's where I'm currently located. Thank you. Did I miss anyone else? Any Penn students who want to introduce themselves? I think I, I sort of, res this was on pretty short notice that I joined the yes, panel. Yes, Ari. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, should I do the thing or... Yes, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm Ari. Um, I am originally from Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is currently where I'm, I'm at home learning remotely. Um, and I'm pursuing a master's degree in the CIS department. Um, technically in sort of my second year, but also kind of my first because I, I originally enrolled as part of a four plus one like submatriculation type thing with uh, at my undergrad school Haverford so so I did a, a, a year there and then uh, taking classes for that and then uh, this has been my first year outside of or my first semester outside of uh, after having graduated so uh, yeah 
congratu congratulations, Ari. And um, thank you for participating because uh, you are introducing an option that we haven't yet discussed. We discussed master's programs, we discussed doctoral programs, but we did not discuss the opportunity for current undergraduates to be pursuing a master's degree while still completing their undergraduate degree. So we do have that partnership with Haverford. If you are in Pennsylvania, we also have that partnership with Bryn Mawr College and recently added is LaSalle University. So thank you for reminding me of that, Ari. Okay, so I did want to ask, um, I have a question that we can just go around and answer. Uh, what factors led to you applying to Penn? And what about your experience with your advisor, your instructors or staff at Penn made you decide to attend? So thinking back when you were shopping around for graduate schools, what made the decision for you that Penn is the place where you should be? So I can answer this first, I guess. Um, I I picked out a few places where uh, there were people doing research that I was particularly interested in. Um, and I was kind of deciding between my advisor here and uh, one other advisor who was like very close uh, in terms of my interest. So it came down to kind of how I meshed with my potential advisors as a you know, personality wise and how um, how I thought their leadership styles would work with me and what kind of environment I know that I do well in. Um, and it happened to be that my advisor here at Penn um, is very interested in having students who are like strong willed and self directed and that kind of thing. And the other potential advisor was interested in students who um, took more of like an apprenticeship role. And I wanted the, you know, the self directed leadership style. So I came here. Um, and one of the things about Penn that made me really interested in, in coming here is I love West Philly. I grew up in a neighborhood that's very similar to West Philly. So it felt, it, it felt like coming home every time that I would come back to campus. I'll also say a few things. Um, so when I was looking to apply to graduate school, I discovered kind of by chance that Penn was hosting an open house. So the open house is usually in early November. Um, I remember in this particular year, it was November 1st because I was traveling to Philly on Halloween. Um, and at this open house, which everyone should look out for, I think, I think they usually start marketing the open house uh, in the fall. Um, I had the opportunity to meet a whole bunch of different students and professors throughout the CIS department. And I just felt that everyone I met was very friendly. Um, I felt that I fit in really well with the community. I also love that the CIS department is a really good size. Um, I wanted to be in a place that had a lot going on. So I really enjoyed the community when I was able to visit Penn. Um, the campus is also super beautiful. I asked my tour guide to show me the ugliest building on campus because I couldn't believe that the campus was so beautiful, but um, it's, it's not too good to be true. It's just true. I really enjoyed my visit that time. Yeah, I guess I can hop on as well. Um, so when I was considering schools, like I think definitely what led me to look for certain schools was research topics and what led me to eventually pick Penn was the people. Um, at least as far as PhDs go, the joke runs that a doing a PhD is like getting married to your advisor. Um, so uh, it's, it's, I think that's definitely the most critical thing for, for PhDs. For masters, it's a little bit different, but um, uh, for, for a doctoral program, you're in it for, you know, five or more years. So you want to make sure that it's somewhere where you're going to be happy. Um, and so um, I, when I was visiting after I was admitted, um, I talked to both of my, so I have two advisors and I talked to both of them. And the thing that eventually got me to, um, you know, uh, consider them as, 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 as my top choice was that they seemed really invested in my personal development as, you know, they, they were interested in learning about my career goals and things like that. Whereas the sense that I got from other professors that I interviewed with was that they wanted me to do work for them. And I think it's really important in a PhD program that you it's, it's clear, you, have, you and your advisor have a clear understanding of what you're gonna get out of it. Um, so that really uh, attracted me about um, Penn. And then the second thing, um, kind of contrary to what Alyssa said, 
I kind of like the fact that in my particular department, in my particular subfield, it's very small and very closely, uh, very, very tightly knit. Um, so it's very easy to access everything that's going on. And there's a lot of attention that was given to, to me and my birth. So um, basically, that's why I ended up choosing that. Okay, um, in, if anyone else wants to answer, you can jump in. Otherwise, I'm gonna move forward with our third question. Um, so thinking about the transition. So everyone here obviously completed an undergraduate degree before coming into Penn Engineering, whether it was at Penn or not, there is definitely a learning curve from shifting from undergraduate to a graduate program. So can you talk about what that transition was like? What were some of the most difficult aspects? For those of you, we have a lot of PhD students. So if you can talk about that for the, on the PhD side. And then for um, we do have a master's student. So if you can talk about what that transition was like from undergraduate to master's and what you did to sort of overcome the initial shock. So I can sort of speak a little bit to the master's student perspective. Um, so I not only was transitioning um, into graduate school, being out of school for about four to five years, but being in the MCIT program, it's generally geared towards students who don't have a strong computer science background that are looking to gain that education. Um, so it was kind of like a double whammy where it's, I'm now you know, re-entering an academic environment, but I'm also studying a discipline that I don't necessarily have a lot of prior formal knowledge in. Um, I think one thing that really helped was definitely cultivating relationships of different faculty and staff um, to make sure that I felt comfortable in the new environment I was in. I had access to, you know, whether it was uh, leaders in the diversity center, my academic advisor or program director, just to make sure that I could lean on other people for advice on who to reach out to or just general tips and tricks for successfully making it through that first year. I also think, you know, just finding peers um, in my program who I could really bond with um, socially as well as lean on for support academically definitely helps. So I, I think I guess overall what I would say is definitely uh, what helped is not approaching my experience as me and trying to make it through this program, but really seeing it as I'm a member of this community. How do I really make sure I'm tapping into the right sources and really connected with as many people as possible um, to really make it through that transition. Thanks, Perpetual. I think you're really highlighting the difference between sort of surviving and thriving. You know, a lot of people you come in, especially after years out of school, um, you know, it takes a lot of courage to come back into school in a graduate program and then into something that you're not familiar with um, and to shift your mindset to say, you know, this is an opportunity for me to expand instead of saying, OK, I just got to make it through. So thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? Um, yeah, so I went to a very small college um, for undergrad and I came straight through from undergrad to graduate school. And my undergraduate degree was not in computer science. So I was transitioning disciplines and changing environments. And there was sort of a lot of, a lot of things that are sort of normal at large universities that I had just never experienced before. So my graduating class was 500 students. And now I'm in a machine learning lecture with 250 students. And my, my largest class in undergrad was like 30 students. It was, it was very different. Um, and sort of a little bit overwhelming at times. And I think what helped me a lot was just making friends that I could ask stupid questions to. Just like, how, how do you take notes in a large lecture like this when you can't just like stop and ask questions? How do you um, deal with sort of like homework assignments when you can't just like sit in office hours with the professor for an hour and like ask them whatever you want because you're not, you know, the only student they have to worry about. Um, and sort of making friends who had been through that in undergrad and were comfortable with that culture um, was, was very helpful for me. Just to, um, yeah, just to sort of, I mean, like second that, uh, sort of second that, because I also came from a pretty small undergrad uh, school and um, 
I mean, the other interesting thing was that I was kind of doing this at the same, since I started uh, in the four plus one program, I was still completing my undergrad while I was starting to take graduate courses at Penn. So I sort of got to experience both at the same time a little bit. And it was kind of a contrast in terms of, in like terms of what uh, Zachary was just talking about with the uh, size, like the classes were a lot bigger and it was, Kind of an interesting. I, I I think what helped me a lot was trying to make it a point to reach out to other students and to reach out to professors just to cultivate those relationships because I think like other people were saying that was that was a really crucial factor in helping me kind of like do a lot better and yeah. So I think one of the transitions is a transition in attitude. Um, when you're an undergraduate, your your job basically is to get good grades when you're a PhD student, your job is to do good research. And the point of the classes is to prepare you to do good research. So instead of, you know, getting an A on this, in this class being the goal, the goal is understand the material in this class well enough that you can use it to do your research. And if that means that you end up getting a B in that class, but you understood what you needed to from it, that's okay. Um, I, I think a PhD program is often described as drinking from a fire hose. And I think adopting that kind of attitude makes it a little bit less overwhelming because you realize like, okay, yes, I'm drinking from this fire hose. Uh, everything has ramped up really quick, <laughs> but I actually just need to swallow as much as I can and then you know use that to get where, where I'm trying to go. Um, it's it's no longer me following a degree program that somebody else has built. It's me following my own research program. Yeah, I also wanted to chime in about the process of starting research itself because I that was definitely the one of the more awkward parts for me. Um, so every grad school and every professor handles this a little bit differently. Um, so some grad schools you're directly matched with a professor. For example, in electrical engineering, that is the case. Um, whereas in some others, you have to do rotations and find your advisor. So that can be a very different process, uh, depending on where you go. Um, at, at least in my experience, the, the way to, um, you know, one thing that's, that's critically important is one, knowing, like trying to get a good sense of what you want, spend a lot of time reflecting. And the second thing is do whatever you can to uh, squash down any reservations you have about asking questions. I like it, it took me a while because I'm, I'm naturally a pretty shy person, but eventually my tactic to understand what I wanted to work on and what I wanted to do was just to bug people to no end, just like walk around lab and ask people, oh, oh, what are you doing? What is this? What is that? Um, it, it is really awkward at the beginning, but like that, that is the way that you learn and you get your feet wet. Um, so and if you're in a good lab, then people will be supportive of that. And if you're rotating and people aren't supportive of that, then that might be a good sign about whether you should or shouldn't pick that lab. Um, so yeah, it's definitely like Sonia said, um, the goal of the PhD program is to do good research. So although classes are important, they are something that's meant to prepare you for research. And so finding your research fit during your first semester or your first year is probably the most important thing you can do. The transition was super weird for me. Um, I graduated in 2020, so I was already kind of sort of used to online school. And then I actually remember before I applied, so this was probably like, probably even way back in summer of 2019, I kept on asking myself if I should take a gap year. Um, and then I also kind of asked myself, you know, what would you do on a gap year anyway? So I continued to apply, um, even though I didn't entirely know what I was doing. Um, and then I thought to myself, should I take a gap year? And then for some reason, I decided to intern during the summer anyway, which is kind of like the opposite of a gap year. So uh, I would say uh, before starting your PhD program, especially if you're coming straight from undergrad, give yourself some time to rest during the summer. Um, I feel like school can be pretty intense. Um, so give, your time, give yourself that time to rest. Um, and in your first two-ish years, you'll still be taking classes. And it felt a lot more intense to me taking classes as a graduate student uh, as opposed to taking classes as an undergraduate student, even though during undergrad I did take graduate classes so I still don't know why it feels so different now. I feel like I work harder in classes now, even though I take two or three as opposed to five or six 
Um, and I think from what Sonia said, it is trying to get that deeper understanding. Um, and I was also felt, I also felt completely lost when I first started because, you know, um, I'm not at school. It's, it's really hard to just, you can't turn around and say like, Hey, like, do you have any hints on the homework or did you understand this, this concept in class? You can't do that to a neighbor anymore. Um, I sleep there. I study here. Sometimes I sleep here and study there. So that felt really weird to me as well. Um, but just like a lot of other people said, just reach out to a lot of other people, especially people in your cohort, especially people in your cohort, in your class. Um, it really helps me to have a really good study group for one of my classes. And we would often once a week just uh, meet and talk about like different concepts or the homework in class. Um, and just also get involved in your department. The CIS department has the doctoral association. Zach is also in it. We plan events and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're starting school, um, especially if it's online, just go ahead and say hi to everyone. Um, everyone's very welcoming, so you don't have to worry about them, like, feeling weird about you or anything like that. Thanks for that, Alyssa. You actually bring up a really good point, and I'm wondering if anyone else has feedback uh, with this climate that we're in where everything's remote, um, what are you guys doing to build connection? Because all of you talked about that um, how you decided that pen engineering was the right next step for you for graduate school when you came here and you got to interact with your faculty and I'm sure you still interact with advisors, but how do you make connections outside of that relationship? So I can answer that. Um... I also have meetings with my lab mates. I have regular meetings with my lab mates um, for different, various different projects. And um, we have a Slack channel for, or a Slack server, I guess, for our, our whole group. So if somebody wants to get something started, they'll post something to the Slack. So for example, um, there was a group of students recently who wanted to learn more about a specific technique. Um, they cobbled together, you know, listed a few papers and said, hey, here's what we're thinking about reading right now. If anybody has any suggestions and wants to join in, you know, we'd love to talk about these things in a group together. So then that became a, a several week series of uh, discussions about that particular topic. And that's happened a few times for a few different kinds of um, techniques or various things that are happening in the literature that we want to learn more about. So that's, you know, that's an easy way to ramp up and down things as well. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, I do have one final question for all of our um, graduate students. And again, if anyone has questions, please utilize the chat feature or just jump in. But the last question is, what advice would you offer to any guests um, or anyone who might be watching this recording later about their next step? So they're in undergraduate school. They're thinking that they want to get a graduate degree. They're not sure whether it's going to be a master's or PhD or they, they, maybe they know they wanna do research, but they're not sure what they wanna research. What advice would you all offer? I'm full of advice on this topic. <laughs> um, the, the first big piece of advice that I have is, um, you don't have to go directly from undergrad to a graduate program. I didn't, I took a couple of years and I worked. Um, I think there are different kinds of jobs that might help you make this decision more than others. So if you're in engineering and you're trying to decide whether you want a PhD or not, or a master's degree or not, um, get a job in engineering at a company that you really like. Uh, try to figure out what people you know, at your level are doing at other companies. Um, look at what the career advancement options are for people at your company. You know, do the people who are the, the level above you all have master's degrees? Do they all have PhDs? Do people you know, who are the level above you at the next company over, do they all have master's degrees or PhDs? Or does it seem to not matter? And then ask yourself like, oh, do I really like being at this company? Or do I really miss being in a collegiate environment? Do I really want to have more of a big picture, you know, control over what I'm doing? Um, how comfortable am I with being more self-directed? Like ask yourself those kinds of questions. So you, you don't have to jump in directly to a graduate program. and. I think working for a couple of years actually helped me because it, it helped me with time management, having a little bit more um, uh, separation between work and life before I came back to school helped me maintain that. So I, I had a healthier relationship to my work when I was in graduate school. Um, 
But if you want to make that decision, like if you're thinking, I don't know about this, Sonia, I don't think I want to, you know, go into the the real world, quote unquote, and then have to come back. Like, that's also legit. Uh, the way that I would make a decision about that right now, if you're thinking about like, do I want a PhD versus a master's versus just you know, the degree that I have, um, look at job postings and look at job postings in industry and in academia. Talk to your professors, talk to graduate students if you have access to graduate students um, and just see what their daily lives are like. And if you like, it, if, if what you're hearing sounds awesome for one group and not the other, there's your answer. I have several pieces about this. Um, one thing I would say is try to ask as many people, um, that, as many questions as possible, especially ask them uh, why they went to grad school or didn't go to grad school um, and whether you think, whether they think it's a good idea for you to go to grad school. And, while you're doing this, you should also keep in mind that if your goals and their goals are different, then the advice that they give you might not apply to you. So I remember I was considering grad school and I asked a bunch of software engineers at my internship if I should go to grad school. And a whole bunch of them said no, and I freaked out a little bit. And I realized, you know, you don't need a PhD to be a software engineer. So of course, um, their perspective will be different from mine. Uh, of course, this also means that you should think long and hard about what your own goals are. What are you really interested? What do you, you know, want to do um, in the future once you're all done with school? And then you can also think about, you know, is grad school necessary for that? Um, and, and I totally had another thing, but it is slipping my mind. Um, but I would also say, uh, I've been trying to write up my own experiences in college, in grad school, you know, figuring out what I do, why I do this. Um, and I've been putting up a bunch of like little stories on my own website, personal website. If you want to check those out for my input, um, you can go to Alyssa Huang, A-L-Y-S-S-A-H-W-A-N-G dot com slash advice. I hope that helps you out since we don't have um, unlimited time during this session. Oh, look, it's on the screen. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said um, so far. I definitely think for those of you on the panel, you're already making the right choices in terms of hearing from graduate stu students and getting their perspectives and then using that to inform your own choices. One, uh, another idea I would add to that is being honest and maybe having your own self-assessment, like re really writing down, these are my interests, these are my values, I know these are my strengths, I know these are my areas of improvement. Um, what kind of environment are environments that I can, you know, really be my best self in or can really thrive in academically or socially. And I think even just the practice of writing that down will give you a lot more confidence um, and a little bit more certainty about what path you want to chart moving forward. Um, but I think as long as you're being honest with yourself and you know, you're not pursuing graduate school because you're unsure of your career, um, I think you're in a good place. I definitely think it's I would say graduate school is is less about, um, I would say it's good to be confident entering graduate school, knowing who you are, what you want out of the experience, rather than kind of seeing where things go. So as long as you're honest with yourself, seeking advice, seeking different perspectives, I think you'll be in a good spot. So don't worry too much. No one really has it all figured out anyway. <laughs> I wanted to address one of the specific parts of the question that like Christina had posed, which is if it's okay if you don't know what you wanna research, like for, for people who are interested in doing a PhD, I think that's easier to figure out once you get there than the bigger question of, do I want to live the lifestyle and do I want the outcome of a graduate program? Um, I think it's pretty normal for people to come into a program with really broad interests as far as like what they wanna work on and what they wanna do. And a lot of programs, most programs, in fact, are catered to that, right? You take classes that are kind of general, so you have some time to settle into something and find something that interests you. And um, a lot of programs have rotation programs, so you can work in different labs and get a feel for, um, for, for different styles of, of work and different styles of management. So you, I, I would say that's one of, that is, if you know what you want to work on, then that's great. If you don't, that's okay. Um, as everybody else said, I think the most important thing is 
like to look at your big picture goals and not your specific research goals and think about whether grad school fits into those. Um, and I'll also, um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about people's, uh, uh, you know, goals or things like that. Um, my email is vasant, V-A-S-A-N-T at cs.upen um, edu. And uh, yeah, so if anybody has questions about things, they can email me after this as well. Thanks, Basan. Uh, we actually, um, we have two ESE PhDs on this uh, panel and we have a question from someone, Amaya, who applied to the electrical engineering PhD program. And she was wondering if she could, if you could speak about when students begin working in a research group, do they come in with an advisor right away and start research their first year or focus on classes and exams in the first year? So for me, what happened is um, I, I came in with an advisor um, I applied specifically because I wanted to work with that advisor um, and I started working in the group immediately. That said, my advisor was very understanding about the fact that I was taking a lot of classes and focusing on my quals and all of that stuff. Um, but I, I started coming to meetings. I started like poking around the research that's you know aligned with the group's topic that I was interested in um, pretty much immediately. So it, in ESC, we don't have a rotations system or anything like that to my knowledge. Um, it's possible things have changed since I was <laughs> since I was a first year, but um, you you have to focus down enough, you know, to pick somebody that you want to be your advisor when you apply. Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll second that as well. Mine was um, actually maybe possibly even more constrained because I had two advisors, and so like they had a very specific kind of collaboration in mind, and I was you know, um, I was recruited to, to specifically work on a project that he had in mind and then, you know, see where it went. Um, so in general, in ESC, uh, the way that it works is that uh, you come in with an advisor. So um, I don't know if you have, you don't have to write in your application, like I want to work with this person and only this person, or I will not come to Penn, right? It doesn't work like that. Um, but like if you have a general interest, like say you're interested in machine learning or say you're interested in circuits or say you're interested in robotics, um, you can, you know, look at specific people. And if one of them likes you, then you'll go through an interview process and then uh, matriculate into their group. Um, but like Sonia said, the emphasis is definitely on classes, um, definitely the first year and sometimes even the second year. Um, so I like, I got my feet wet in research during my first year, but didn't do anything too serious. Um, like maybe the summer of my first year was when I really started to like get ownership of my uh, of my first project and things like that. Uh, but before that, I was mostly just like I, I work in an experimental lab, so it's mostly just learning how to, how to measure things, learning the basics of what we do, and 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 things like that. Thank you, Vasant and Sonia. Um, and thank you for your question, Amaya. Uh, if there are any other questions, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, um, I am gonna move us forward. Thank you all of our graduate students for participating. Thank you for making yourself available and for sharing authentically your experience so that others can be a little more informed about their next steps. So I did wanna highlight again, as Alyssa pointed out, she has a really, really helpful personal website that she's designed um, and she references it when people come to her and ask her about advice for starting a PhD program. And so I think she has some dynamic information, sort of how-to guides here. So if you're interested at all, please go to alyssawong.com uh, backslash advice. Uh, there's a lot uh, to see and there's a lot to learn and you can learn just about her and she talks about her personal experience, her journey to the PhD. So, um, you know, please peruse it at your um, time. And then I'd just like to encourage you, thank you for being with us. Um, please stay connected with Penn Engineering, especially graduate admissions. We do have several social media pages and I know each of the different departments represented here, both um, CIS and ESE have their own social media pages. So you, there's so many ways to stay connected. You can um, stay connected with students here if you're interested, if, you, if the students are available, I'm sure they would um, be happy to answer some of your questions. If you would like to just get a little more information about some of our graduate programs, you can go to our graduate admissions website, which is listed here and fill out an inquiry form. Since the PhD deadline is December 15th every year and you wanna learn more about a 
specific PhD program, you can definitely fill out the inquiry form. Um, and that's all for us. Thank you for being here. I'll stick around for about three minutes in case anyone has last minute questions. But again, thank you so much for your time and I hope you and your family continue to be well. Take care. Thank you students. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> thank you so much. No problem, thank you, Amaya. And thank you, Roberts. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>